All right, hello. Uh, I'm Britta. I work at Elasticsearch. And uh, so, so I joined Elasticsearch a year ago. So that was the first of May. Uh, but I come from a very different background. So I come from academia and I was working mainly on image processing. So before I came to Elasticsearch, um, I did not actually know what was going on in information retrieval, right? So I came to Buzzwords last year. I was only at Elasticsearch for one month. I was talking to a guy and he said, oh, wow, you work for Elasticsearch, cool. Uh, so tell me something. When I put in Google, when I put the quotes, it gives me phrases. How does that work with the inverted index? Right? Uh, that was very embarrassing. I didn't know. <laughs> uh, a colleague saved me. Right? So I went home in shame and thought what to do with myself. And I thought, hey, I come from academia. I'm good at reading books. Right? So I read this book. Now, this is the book. Um, if you haven't read it, and you don't know what information retrieval and scoring and all the things I'll be talking about is about, this is a really good starting place. And there was two or three chapters uh, about scoring that were particularly interesting for me. So what I mean by scoring is um, determine the relevance of a document given some search request. For example, given the keywords football or World Cup, what is the most relevant news article a user might want to read. And note that this might not just be related to the search things the user types in, but it might also be related to time, right? Might be some, you want to have a news and not the old, so. Or given the criteria, someone knows Java or has some expected income or lives at some place, would that be a good candidate for the job that I'm currently offering, right? So this is what I mean by scoring. So anyway, I read this book and then I thought, okay, now I know how scoring works, right? At least in theory. Uh, but then I figured, well, um, if I'm to be a programmer, maybe I should also figure out how this works implementation-wise. How, how is that actually implemented? Um, so, so you have to understand, if you actually want to know how scoring in Elasticsearch works, you have to know a little bit about Elasticsearch. And in particular, you have to know the Lucene code base to see where things are actually happening. And I, didn't know how to put my experience in words, so I drew a little comic. Right? So, <laughs> so this is me, right? This is the score. And I know it comes out here miraculously, right? Where does it happen? Well, <laughs> it was a bummer. <laughs> All right? So, and hey, hold on, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Now the slides are, I will be online later, so don't worry, you can look at them many times. So, so anyway, so this brings me to the purpose of the talk. What's the purpose of my talk? So, uh, first of all, I want to relieve you of the burden uh, to find a point where to get started, right? After this experience, I had the feeling it should be much easier to do and much easier to understand. So this is what this talk is going to be about, and it has basically two parts. So the first is uh, I will give a short introduction into the theory, that is, into the vector space model. And this is the most common way documents are scored right now everywhere, and especially if you use Elasticsearch. Uh, and then I will talk about how you can tweak scores with Elasticsearch. So what we have already and how, also how you can implement new things. Right, so, but first a little bit of theory. So TFIDF, who have you heard of it? Oh, you all know everything already, right? <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> <clears throat> okay, TFIDF is the most common ways to score documents ever. If you use Elasticsearch and you do not define anything, you didn't give anything, then everything you get will be scored by TFIDF. That is, text will be scored by TFIDF. So how does it work? So say you have uh, some query, and it would be, in this case, would be brown, oh, sorry. Uh, brown and fox is the query, so somebody's looking for a brown fox, maybe, right? And then you have two documents. One is the quick brown fox, likes brown mice, and the other is the red fox. So the first thing you do is you count how often the query terms actually appear in the document. Right? So in, for document one, this would be, for example, okay, brown appears twice, fox appears once, and for document one, fox appears once and brown appears zero times. So one thing you should note here is that uh, this does not respect any ordering of the terms, right? And this is also called, this is why it's sometimes called the bag of words model, because there's no ordering left. You just put it in your bag and then that's it. So now the question is, how do we put this into our score? How do we give this a numeric value? How, how do we actually say, okay, th and this is then the ordering, right? You can just count these things, but that would be pretty naive. 
So, um, I gave you a hint already. So you actually look at these things as a vector, right? And this is where the vector space model comes. And this is really just like in school, when you had vectors and you had your x-axis and y-axis, and then you draw your vector and, and that's it. So you actually turn your documents and your query into a vector. Okay, and then how does it look like? So here's how this would look like. So you would have, instead of your x-axis, you would have your fox axis, and the y-axis would become the brown axis. And documents and query are uh, both points in this vector space. So here, for example, you would have document one, that would be one zero at coordinate one zero, and you would have document, oh, sorry, document two. And document one would be at, co at coordinate one two, and the query would be at coordinate one one. And then what you really want to figure out is, what is the distance between these vectors, right? And distance, I mean, you could only just measure the distance of the tips, but that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, as you can imagine. Um, so uh, the first thing people usually talk about when they talk about um, <coughs> scoring is they talk about cosine similarity. So this is a, a popular thing in theory, uh, not so much in practice, I think. Uh, and the way you, you look at this is you say, okay, you have your query and you have your documents as a vector, but you look at the angle between these two. And then you don't actually take the angle as the score, but you take the cosine. And why the cosine? Well, because the cosine starts at one and then decreases to zero as it approaches 90 degrees. So documents that would be perpendicular to uh, the query in this vector space, uh, well, would just be score of zero and then get negative. Right. Uh, so one thing I didn't mention before, I just, just realized is, uh, if you would have a third term, right, I'm talking about vector spaces, if you would have a third term, the third axis would actually come out of the plane, right? And then if you would have a fourth term, you would have a four-dimensional space, but I'm not sure how to put this, so, right, and so on and so forth. Right. Okay, this is cosine similarity. Um, it's not really, well, it might be useful for some cases, right? But if you have longer text or really natural language text, this does not really work out. So there's a better way to do this. Um, another distance measure that you could think of is you could actually, instead of doing this angle or instead of just looking at the tips, project this vector onto the axis that is spanned by the query. And this is actually what TF-IDF does. So you have your query spans this axis here, you project both documents uh, perpendicular onto this axis, and the score is actually the distance from the origin. So document two would score much lower than document one because the projection is just farther away from the origin, right? And this is what TF-IDF does, and that's it. No, not really. <laughs> no, no, it goes on. So, <clears throat> so there's two things that are very important when you want to understand Lucene uh, scoring. So the first is shorter text is more relevant than longer text. Now, this is not completely true, but um, the idea is this. Say, for example, you have, you're looking for, I don't know, holiday in China or something like that, and your uh, document basis actually contains tweets where somebody tweets about their holiday in China, but it also contains articles and it also contains books maybe, right? And somebody talks in the beginning that he's going to holiday and then in the end he's going to a Chinese restaurant and he feels like in China. Well, this wouldn't be too relevant for the query, right? So what Lucene does internally is actually taking this into account and making sure that longer documents are, are weighted lower depending on how the term frequency is and shorter documents are sort of weighted higher. Okay, and how this actually looks is this. So say you have your document here, this is the original document vector, and now it turns out that this document is very long. Then what you would do is you would shorten this vector, depending on how long it is. And now you can imagine if the term appears very often, then this would be up here somewhere. So if you shorten it, it would still be somewhere here, right? So it's just a trade-off, sort of. So you shorten this vector if it's longer, you lengthen it a little bit if it's shorter, and then depending on that, the score gets, of course, higher or lower. Now, this is something that is independent of the term. But there is another very important property that is dependent on the term, and that is called the document frequency. Right. And so, so the idea is this. The words that appear often in documents are less important than words that appear less often. Think, for example, of the, or what, or who, aware or something like this, right? This is usually fairly completely independent on what you're querying, and usually the user is, well, wants to get their keywords done. How do you identify the keywords? Well, exactly that. You look at the document frequency of this term, 
and then you weight your terms accordingly. And the way this would look like in vector space is like this. So you have, for example, fox. If fox appears very often in documents, you would move the vector a little bit to the left. And if it pairs very, very rarely, then this is a very important term, so you would move it a little bit to the right. And depending on where you move it, the score gets higher and lower. Right? Okay. So these are the two most important things for TF-IDF. Right. Now, now you probably know how it works, but it, as you can imagine, I mean, there's these two factors that are very important. So the question is, how many factors are there? Right? Okay. And this is how it really looks like. <laughs> So if you go to the Lucene web page, there's a, it's a very nice homepage, uh, or very nice documentation about how the actual score is computed. But this year, this for example, this is just the term count. They decided to put the square root, but yeah. This year is the document frequency, so this is actually used in this uh, formula here. And you've probably heard of it, this is the inverted document frequency by which you actually weight your terms, respectively. So this is the length here. That is roughly one divided by the square root and so on. But then you have other factors like the boost, there's some query norm that is seldom used, but it's still there, and so on and so forth. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so, so I hope now you have an idea of uh, what TF-IDF is for natural language text. And uh, if you ever try it out and you run into strange things, you maybe have an idea why this might be. Right. That was TF-IDF. Good. Um, so uh, there have been many talks about search uh, on, on this conference already, and, and you probably know, or probably already knew before, that there's many more fancy equations with lots of Greek letters, so, so can we also use them? And yes, you can, because Elasticsearch is built on top of uh, Lucene, so everything that is in Lucene for scoring implemented, you can also use in Elasticsearch. So we have language metal scoring, BM25, DFR similarity, and so on and so forth. So here's the link to the, to the homepage, to the Lucene homepage, if you, if you want to know more about the implementation, if you really want that. But, yeah. Good. And how do you learn about this? Well, you read this book. <laughs> you check out the similarity module documentation for Elasticsearch. And then you read Elasticsearch, the definite guide, which is coming out soon. Right? And then, and then you're done. <clears throat> So I'm not going to talk about how to actually put this in a mapping, how to actually implement it. I'm not going to search JSON because you not remember anyway, right? You can look this up in the documentation. So, okay, right. So, so one more thing about TF-IDF. So TF-IDF is actually used for for natural text. That is when people write articles, when people really communicate, when they write mails, when they write books, and so on and so forth. This is what TF-IDF is tuned for, and this is also what the Lucene TF-IDF is tuned for. So if you're doing usual Natural lex queries and natural language text queries, um, TF-IDF will probably be sufficient for you. So I knew, know very few people who actually changed the similarity because they had any problems, if they are only looking for text, right? But you might not be satisfied with that. You might need more. So when would you need to actually tweak the score? So first of all, uh, you will have numerical values that you want to take into account. Say, for example, you have some popularity rating of some item, right? You have, I don't know, a web page that shows movies for a certain actor. Then you probably do not just want to order them, but you might want to order them maybe by how popular these movies are. So to make sure that the user gets good movies and not bad movies, right? Or you might want to sell some item and you want to get rid of this item, so you put it on top. Or you, it's more costly, so you want to put it on top. Or it's new, and that's why you want to put it on top. So if you have uh, such an idea, and it is in your document, you actually want the score to be influenced by that. So you might also want to have some distance of a numerical value. Say, for example, you want to book a hotel somewhere, and uh, you want to find out, well, <clears throat> how far is this hotel from this or that location, and you want the score to act accordingly. That is, when it's farther away, you maybe want the score to be lower than if it's closer. Uh, another thing is you might want to score tags. Um, now, I said before, this, this example with a programmer, you're looking for a programmer, right? And the programmer knows several languages. Um, now, suppose a programmer puts 10 languages, um, and you're searching for someone who knows Java, right? So what you would actually get is because of this uh, field length that is taken into account, what you would get is all the people that only know Java and nothing else. Right? And that's not desirable. And also, you also do not want the score to be tweaked by the fact that many other people know the language or few other people know the language, right? 
It's, it doesn't make sense in this case because it's not an actual language, it's actually text. And then maybe you're crazy and you want to write your own text scoring function, right? This is also one place where you would actually need to tweak your score. Or you want to combine all these. Right, so I'm going to give you an example of where this is actually used. <coughs> Just to make sure you, uh, you trust that it's really... So can you see that? Yeah. Right. So this is an example for, uh, it's not so well, but this is a neat little project where people use this actually for, for image scoring. So they have a, a, a data set of images and they're looking for images that are similar to a particular color. So for example, here I can click on, on I don't know, red and then it'll return me all the red images or images that contain a lot of red or you have green and then you will give me all the images that have something with green in them, right? So this is something where you would actually need to have your own score. Right. Okay. Um, so what we have in Elasticsearch is a particular kind of query. So that is the function score query. And it works like this. So first of all, you put the query or the filter that you would have before. Uh, just a regular thing. And then you can define a bunch of functions. And what's going to happen is this query or filter will be executed first. It will return some documents. And then these documents will again be scored, then reordered, and only then will the result be returned. Now, why is that so? Um, well, because scoring is a very expensive operation, so you really want to filter a query before and sort that out. Right. So you have this query, these functions, and these applied, well, to the matching docs. Oh, yeah, and then you can also filter by function. So there's many options for, this, for these functions. So you have field value factor, for example, uh, that would do the thing I would, uh, that I said before, you have a field, for example, popularity, and you want to actually make this influence the score. Um, you have distance fun oh, sorry. You have distance functions, the way you can say an origin and some sort of scale, and then it would tweak the scale according to or however far this field value of this document is from this or that given value. We have random scoring, if you want to shuffle your results a little bit. Boost factor, which you can use for the tax, for example. Okay, and at this point, I could give uh, a nice demonstration on uh, uh, an artificial data set and explain how it all works and so on and so forth, um, but I already did that. So I made a webcast, a screencast of that, right? It took me forever to do that. I had to listen to my own voice for three days. So please, please go and watch it. <laughs> because, and it's also why I'm not gonna talk about that right now, right? So you can go and watch it. And there's also some, some examples on how this can be used here. Um, but for the remainder of this talk, uh, I actually want to talk about this part. So I want to talk about what do you want to, what do you do if you want to write your own scoring function? How can you do that with Elasticsearch? So, as I said before, uh, you have all these different functions that you can apply, uh, and one of them is the script score. Okay, so script score just says, okay, I take a bunch of parameters. And I use these parameters and some values of my document to create my own score. Right? So uh, parameters can be any constant uh, that are independent of the document and that you can pre-compute. Uh, language. Uh, so we have Python, Groovy, Envil, native, all sorts of things that you can do. I and mean, I hope you find one of the languages you probably know. All right. And now the question is, what will be in the script? What options do you actually have? So, uh, first of all, of course, you have the document values. So if you want your score to be uh, sort of influenced by the document values, you can access this by a specific variable that's called underscore doc or doc. Uh, and you can access the actual value. So this, this is your envelope notation, right? It's, it's similar in all the languages, but this is the envelope notation. Uh, access the field uh, by, well, by the name of the field, and then dot value just gives you the value of this field. And then you can do all sorts of things with it. For example, you can say, okay, I want to square this for some reason, or because Lucene does it, or whatever. And yeah, so this way you can access the doc uh, values. And then we have a new thing, and this is the one thing I actually want to advertise today, that is uh, underscore index, and this is a variable that actually allows you to get uh, all the statistics that are in the Lucene index. And this is the thing that is new, and it's super flexible, and you can do many things with it, so this is why I'm going to talk about it from now on. Right. So, what is in an index? Okay, we were talking before about uh, uh, word counts, right? Oh, 10 minutes. 
really get hairy. Okay, uh, word counts. So, so uh, and this is actually called so the technical term for this is term frequency. So, for example, in this document here, uh, the quick brown fox likes brown mice. The term frequency of brown would be two, and the term frequency of dark fox uh, would actually be one. Sorry, this slide is wrong. Okay, but you get my meaning, right? Okay, and the way you access this is really just underscore index at the field for this term, give me the term frequency. And if the term doesn't appear, it will, it will just return zero. It will not crash on you or anything, hopefully. Right? And this is how the query would look like. So, so you have function score, you define script score, and if you define Anvil, you don't need anything else. And this is the script. So this, for example, would give you uh, documents that contain the term, in this case, Berlin, most often. But you can go further than that. You can say, OK, I want to define a field and, and certain words, and then I want to iterate over all these terms and sum something up. For example, in this case, in this very easy case, I just want to sum up all the term frequencies. And this will be my new score, because I think this is good for some reason. It might be, right? Good, document frequency. So this is what I was talking before. How often does a term appear in any document, regardless of how often it actually appears in it? Right? You can get this also. In this case, uh, the function would be df. And I mean, document frequency, for example, for i in these two uh, sentences would be two, even though the i appears four times. Right? It's just dependent on if it's in a document or not. OK, and there's more stuff. Uh, total term frequency, some total term frequency. I'm not going to go into details, because it's really nice documented by this wonderful programmer. So go and check it out. Um, one thing that we cannot have in the uh, Lucene index is the token count. That is, how many words does your document actually contain? Okay, this is something that you uh, uh, have to do, well, not by yourself. You can do it uh, with a word count type. So if you want to know more about it, uh, there's the documentation here. Um, you can just configure that before indexing, and then it will actually store with the document uh, the number of tokens that are in this field. So that was Nick. Nick sitting there. He did that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really good. All right. OK, and another thing you have is, for example, positions. OK, so together with uh, your term frequencies and document frequencies and all that, uh, what is also scored, uh, stored or can be stored by Lucene, is stored by default, is the uh, positions. So say, for example, you have the sentence, I am Sam, Sam I am, then the positions for I would be 0, 4, and the positions for am would be 1, 5. And we'll, we'll see in a minute what this is good for. OK, and there is more. There is offsets. And then there is all sorts of payloads. And you can all access this through the underscore index. Right? But now I want to show some examples. So, right. so remember TFIDF, this terrible equation here? Right? You can do it in 17 lines. Check it out. So <laughs> here's how it goes. So this is, I mean, this uppercase sigma is just a summation. right? You iterate over all the terms. So these are your terms here, for example. So this just means four each term. Next. Uh, TF, so the term frequency, uh, you can get this with the underscore index here. Hold on, here and here, right? And then you just put this here. Then times IDF, so IDF is this horrible thing here, but you can just put it in here. So this would be that thing. The norm, this is not exactly the same. It's not exactly how it works in Lucene, but it's, it's a similar thing, right? Right, and there you're done. TF, IDF, 17 lines. No sim score, or no similarity, no weight, no nothing. Awesome. Right, a phrase score in 13 lines. Awesome, right? So, so this actually makes use of the positions. So you can get the positions for, uh, for, for example, names for John and Smith, and then you can just do uh, a list intersection, sort of, and figure out when Smith appears after John and what's the minimal distance. And you can do this in 13 lines, as you can see here. Right. <clears throat> OK, I can give you a very rough estimate of the running time. Uh, but maybe since the time is running low, I'm not going to. Sorry? Oh. Oh, all right. You put up the 10 minute sign. Oh, no, no problem. No, 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 no problem. OK. <laughs> Man, I was. OK. No, 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 it's not good. All right. <laughs> All right, so uh, so I tested for this for this little phrase scorer, right? I just ran it. I don't know. It's it's really stupid, right? It was a really stupid runtime estimation. I just ran it five or ten times, and then I just compared phrase scorer and TFIDF, and I tried to compare it to Lucene, but as you could see before, it's not really the same. So please don't quote this anywhere, right? Don't tweet 
Britta says Elasticsearch can do or something because it has to be evaluated properly. But just to give you an idea what it can do, so for this little thing, uh, TF-IDF, uh, Lucene is of course quickest, 317 milliseconds. It was a big data set, a really huge shard. Okay. And uh, well, native script, which just means you plug in your own Java thing, was well, roughly four times as much, right? Or five times as much, maybe. And uh, Anvil, well, Anvil is considerably slower. Uh, however, remember that Anvil is really easy to do, or Groovy, or Python, or whatever you have, because you do not have to recompile or anything, right? You just type it there, and then you press apply, and then it'll, it'll work. So it still has its use, as I will show in a minute. Right, so practical advice, if you actually want to use that, if you want to have your own scoring function, sort of, what should you do? First thing, check if it's already there. So we have, as I said before, uh, we have the field value factor, the distance function, the random scoring, the boost factor, and you can combine all these, and you can also combine these together with the Lucene score and so on and so forth using the function score query, so, um, so check if it's already there. And if it's there, you're done, that's cool. Um, but what if not? Uh, so you use your favorite scripting language to try things out. As I said, we have plugins for Python, Groovy, Anvil, JavaScript. I'm not sure if we have anything else. Anything? Huh? Ruby? Really? Oh. Oh no, this is taped, right? Oh no. Shit. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're also free. Uh, right, use this to try it out because you will not have to restart your node, you will not have to do anything, you can just type it somewhere, put it in the appropriate folder, it will be reloaded automatically, no matter how you can, you can configure it that way, and then just press apply and you will immediately see the result. Right, it might be a little slower, but you will see the result immediately. Okay, so is it fast enough already? Then you're done. Um, if not, you can use a native script. Um, so I didn't, I said before we have that, I didn't say what it is. So what it actually is, it's a plugin. Uh, you can plug this into Elasticsearch, um, a pre-compiled thing. So this is way faster than scripting, or faster than scripting at least, uh, well because it's, it's just in Java, so there's no execution overhead whatsoever. Um, but it has a downside, of course, that is it needs to be maintained, so whenever Elasticsearch changes API or something, you'll have to, you know, adjust it somewhere. Um, you need to restart the node when you actually change this plugin. So if you're actually running this in production or something, you will have to well, restart each of the node, and that's not a lot of fun, right? And of course, it produces more code, because you have the whole plugin mechanism overhead, right? And then we don't want more code, we want less code. Uh, if you want to see how this actually works, uh, there's a nice example by a colleague of mine, so, so Igor Motov, uh, did a native script example that's also well documented. You can actually just check this out on GitHub, uh, change your scoring function accordingly, follow the advice on the, on the really nice readme that explains everything what you have to do, and then you're done. Right. So, if this is fast enough, again, you're done. Or is this not fast enough? Um, so, so, there's a different way by which you can uh, try to speed up things a little bit. Um, and that is, we have a rescore API. So, the way this works is, you usually, in function score, you would have your query or filter that's executed, then the documents that match the filter are scored by the function score. But you could also have something, maybe you have a really quick method to get maybe the top 1,000 or something on top, but they're not really ordered in the right ordering. You want a more accurate ordering, maybe of the top n. And this is what rescorer is good for. So if you know that the best results are within top n and you only want to rescore these and you know the scoring is really heavy, you use the rescore API. So roughly this looks like this. You would have your query and then you would say rescore. You can give the window size and then you can put your function score here. And this will only execute on a top 50 or top 100 or whatever. Great. So if this is fast enough, this is cool. Um, but what if not? Um, so Lucene is much quicker than, than the implementation of the TF-IDF, as I showed before. Um, and the reason is that Lucene actually makes uh, use of pre-computed values. <clears throat> so for example, uh, this document norm, the length norm that I was talking about before, is actually stored when indexing, right? So they, they put the square root and everything, store it as a 8-bit float, and then just store it. So they just have to retrieve it and multiply. Whereas I, in my script, had to put the square root, actually which is, of course, an intensive operation because it has to be executed on each document. So if you have any means 
to either store some value with the document or to pre-compute them some aha. Uh, pre-compute them with some, try to do this and pass it as a parameter. Okay. Is it fast enough? You're done again. This time for you? I, I'm sorry, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm. <laughs> I owe you one, I think. <laughs> okay. Right. If it's still not fast enough, I'm sorry, you have to wait until all the to dos are done or make a pull request for them. So, what are the to dos right now? Um, so, as I said, I mean, we do not really pre compute any values. Uh, on the fly or anything when indexing. So, so you might want to have an option to actually pre-compute something before you index, then store this with the document and retrieve it the moment you want to score. So we don't have that right now. We also don't have something like pre-compute values before search execution on a shard. For example, the IDF that I was talking about before, this big one plus, one divided by a log, and so on and so forth, this is something that you could actually pre-compute per term before the script executes on all the documents, and that would save you a lot of time. Okay, we don't have that yet. Um, currently, also, this only uses shard statistics. So if you get the document frequency, you will only get the document f frequency of the shard. Uh, we do not have the DFS query then fetch that we usually have yet. So this is something we're missing right now. Uh, another thing that might be good, I'm not sure, is if you could give just the full text and the parameters and it would do the analysis for you depending on of what field this is and break it down into tokens, that would also be good. Well, yeah, that's the to-dos. So. Right. And then last thing. Uh, so I spoke to some people on this conference and told them, and, hey, look here, face cover are 13 lines. And uh, people didn't, often didn't seem too interested and said, you know, this is all very cool and this is nice and nice to play around, but I, I really don't need to tweak the score. I'm, I'm really good with TFIDF. Works perfect for me. But there's more you can do. Okay. Uh, oh. Um, so. So one thing you can, for example, do is you can use it in a script field also. And in a script field, you can do something very different. You could, for example, say, okay, I want to compute my favorite value, or maybe I want to compute my favorite class. Maybe I trained some naive base classifier before, and I want to deploy this model inside the script field and deliver the class on the fly once I retrieve the document. Right? Well, you can do this if it's based on term statistics. And that's cool. Or maybe you haven't trained your naive base classifier yet and you really need to train it. So well, maybe you need all these term statistics and all that. Well, then you can use it inside the aggregations, for example, in a script. And you can do this for each class and thereby figure out what the term statistics are and train. So this is why I find it really cool. Okay, and then, uh, right, this is more or less the end of my talk. Um, if you're now interested in scoring and you want to know more, there were actually a very nice other buzzwords talks here. So, so Clinton gave a talk about how generally how the Elasticsearch API worked and did also, I think, talk a little bit about scoring. Um, there was a nice talk about, uh, from Alexander Zibiryakov uh, just before this one. Uh, it was about search quality in practice. Uh, you could have a talk on learning how to rank. That's also a very interesting topic and really, really broad. Yay, learning how to rank. And if you want to know about implementation <laughs> details, <laughs> so right after me is Itamas in Hesco. I'm not sure how much he's going to say, but we'll see. Right? And that was it. Great, thank you very much. I'm really sorry about the, the sign. Yeah, don't, please don't. That was only uh, really fun. It's so, fun. <laughs> raise your hands for questions. Okay, in the back. Um, just hold the mic. So my, my question is, uh, how efficiently do you compile? Uh, so what I mean is, there is of course the efficiency, programming language efficiency, but what I, what I mean is, if you walk to inverted lists and see if that the word appears in, the, in list one and then in list two, you know? Uh, so to do it efficiently, you just have to walk those lists. You don't have to jump randomly on disk to, to get uh, fields of the document. So when you compile, actually, uh, these scripts, do they just walk the inverted list or they touch something else on disk? Okay, so, so the way this works is actually operates on the Lucene index. So, so what happens is um, that uh, once the scoring is... So, so, okay, it traverses all the documents uh, that match your previous query, right? And this is directly on the Lucene index, so it makes use of all the skip lists and everything. And then once you reach a document that actually matched, it again 
uses only the Lucene index. So it's really just a wrapper for all the Lucene functionality that you know before. So it will, oh, okay. So yeah, in effect, it will be as quick as the Lucene index is. If, if that, I hope this was your question. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. I mean, apart from the fact that we do not do these pre-computations that well, would save us a lot of time, but yeah. And then, of course, you have, if you use a script, I mean, like Python or, or I'm not sure how it is with GUI, I didn't try it out. I heard good things about it, but, but with Emble, definitely you have this execution overhead, and yeah. Great, any more questions? Well, yeah. yes. So th this is a question about implementation details. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, <laughs> it's not very scientific. But uh, so you mentioned that writing Java code it's uh, like faster, uh, mm -hmm. like writing your own plugin. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have to write more code. Why is that? Okay, so um, <laughs> I defer to my next speaker. <laughs> no, um, <clears throat> So, so there's a, the plugin mechanism uh, in, in Elasticsearch. It works via, via juice, right? So you have to register sort of the different functions you have. The way this works is you, you define your scoring function, but this has to be inside a particular class that has to be provided by another class that is registered on runtime and loaded and, and all that. And, and this all overhead, the whole what is the name, where is it registered, and so on. This means you also have to write code for that. And I mean, it's not a big thing really to do. I mean, you can just go to the example, as I said, of, of, of Eager and check it out. Um, but yeah, that's it. That's more code, but it's not a lot more code. You can still do it. It's not as much more code as probably might be when you write your own Lucene similarity, which you can also do. You can also actually, uh, I didn't mention that before, but you can also write your own Lucene similarity and plug that into Elasticsearch. So, yeah. I was just wondering if you want to use like a language model scoring or something like this, how much work would it be? Could you just briefly comment on, I know I'll probably check out the link you, you had on your slide, but if you want to have a language model scorer, let's say from Lucene, do you have to write a plugin for Elasticsearch or how much work would it be to use that? Yeah, so, so language model scoring is implemented in Lucene and you don't have to write anything to use that, you can just plug it in. Um, or not even plug it in, you can just configure either when you index documents or when you search, what, what uh, actually when you index documents, uh, what similarity you want to use, and Lucene has two, so it has uh, Mercer something smoothing and another one. It's both language model uh, modeling, and you can just use that right away. Just from the Java uh, JSON like configuration? Right, or, yeah? exactly. Or it's only just the JSON configuration. You define it when you index the documents in your mapping, what, what, what should be used, and then that's it. I mean, Lucene does, for the language model modeling, it does a little trick to make sure it's above zero, right? So, so usually in language model scoring, if you implement it by the book, you would ne get negative source, you will not get that from the scene. But it's still correct, so yeah, you can use that. Um, yeah, it's all in the documentation. Maybe I should have shown the example, huh? But, yeah. oh, that was the link, so thanks. Okay, good. Anyone else? Great, well, thank you very much again for your presentation. Yeah, welcome.